Good morning, Orchard Hill Church. So great to be with you. Uh, as Russ mentioned, my name is Mike Chilcoat Chili. Uh, I am actually on Young Life staff, but my wife and I consider Orchard Hill our home and our family attends here at Orchard Hill. So it's always so exciting, such a humbling experience to get to, to jump up here and spend a little bit of time with you as we dive into the Word and dive into who Jesus is. Um, I don't know if you're the most staunch, uh, maybe the most you know negative and pessimistic Steeler fan in the world. You have to still be encouraged by Kenny Pickett's debut last night. Let's give it up for that. I mean, come on, he's going to have some growing pains, but that was ridiculous. George Pickens throw that in there. I mean, come on, great draft class. I'm excited. I don't know if you are, but uh, it is the Seahawks and they're terrible. But still, still, come on. Let's not rain on this parade. Um, and if you're not a sports fan, um, last night they had the, uh, the Motley Crue, uh, Poison, Joan Jett, uh, and Def Leppard concert. Uh, tonight's Metallica. So basically, it is hopping in Pittsburgh this weekend. And if people are wondering, where I wonder where Kurt and Faith are, my guess is they're tailgating the Metallica show right now. <laughs> so that's my guess. I don't know for sure. But can't you picture Kurt in a sleeveless Ride the Lightning Metallica shirt right now <laughs> in a parking lot? <laughs> I can. I can't confirm that. But anyway, folks, uh, really fun to be here with you. Uh, we, since the last time I jumped here, here with you, we've had a lot of changes in our family, a lot of exciting stuff happen in July. Uh, my oldest, uh, my daughter Kaylee, uh, got married, which is really exciting, to an amazing guy, Jacob. We're really blessed to have him in the family. And they're actually, actually both going on Young Life staff, which is fun. I have a picture here of uh, some of the wedding shots. This is my wife. I mean, look, she looks like she's 22, but there's Kimmy and Kaylee, which is a fun shot. Next shot here is, uh, this is all three of my daughters. What a fun time for them to be together. And uh, let's see, we got a couple more. There's me in between trying not to sob uncontrollably. Uh, and then we got one of uh, Jacob and Kaylee there. What a, a strapping young guy. And then... Uh, Final one here, this is a celebration. I got a chance to actually do the wedding and perform the ceremony, which was so fun, humbling. Um, it was great. So that's us celebrating. So thanks for letting me share that with you. So fun time, first kid for us to, to be married off. Uh, it was amazing, it was great. It was also a little bit of me that thought, okay, college done, wedding done. So I'm just thinking financially at this point. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, it's been great. And if you're thinking, well, Chile, they both got hired on Young Life staff in Pittsburgh. That seems like a little bit of nepotism. They're in the South Hills. That's pretty much another city down there, right? It's not the same thing. I remember uh, years ago, and I, when I was naive, I moved to Pittsburgh eight years ago when I didn't really know some of the nuances of Pittsburgh. Uh, my dad went to Mount Lebanon, so we have Pittsburgh ties, but I had never lived here. And I was speaking at uh, Upper St. Clair Country Club at this event, and afterwards, some of the old timers, I had mentioned how my dad was a Mount Lebanon grad and uh, was from the South Hills. So these old timers, these older guys come up afterwards, they put their arm around me and they're like, welcome home, son. I'm like, oh, thanks so much. And with a big smile on their face, they're like, where'd you buy a house? Did you, did you settle in Upper St. Clair or Mount Lebanon? And I'm like, you know, naively, I'm like, no, up, up in Wexford, we got to, and they're like, their faces dropped like I had just insulted their grandmother. They're like, why would you do that? And I'm like, well, you know, anyway. We're all friends here, right? So we are continuing our series entitled Clarity Every Day. We've been diving into Psalm 19 that you just heard Russ read a second ago. And we've been walking through the sufficiency, the clarity, and the authority of Scripture. Uh, basically, you know, the Bible. We've been walking through those aspects of it. Today, I'll be leading us through the necessity of Scripture. And we will be, in large part, kind of zooming in and focusing in on verses 10 and 11 in chapter 19. A necessity is something that is indispensable. Sometimes the word necessity gets watered down. We say, you know, it's a necessity that I have Starbucks, or it's a necessity that I get home before kickoff of the Steelers game, or whatever. We kind of water down what a, a true necessity is. But a necessity is something that's indispensable. It's absolutely required. When something that is truly a necessity is downplayed or you know, underplayed or ignored, um, dire consequences can take place. When we don't realize something's a necessity or we, maybe we're ignorant to the whole thing. 
We, we, we either downplay it or we don't even realize that it's a, a true necessity. Boy, um, a real problem can arise if we fall victim to that. Uh, years ago, uh, when I first got my, my first uh, ministry appointment, first time I was sent to a community to do ministry, new to this community, it was in Ohio, and uh, I was fresh out of college, didn't know what I was doing. I was probably two weeks in this community, so I, I knew barely anyone. And uh, I have to pause that the, uh, the cardinal rule of telling a story is to not give away the ending, but I do have to a little bit so that you can enjoy the story. Um, in it, I will be talking about a young guy named Vince. And um, let me just tell you this, Vince made a quick and great recovery. He's totally fine. Uh, it was awesome. You can enjoy the story. You can laugh. Okay. So Vince is doing great. He's doing great and did great pretty quickly after that. So I'm new to this community, and there was a car accident. A car actually struck a young kid named Vince. And uh, Vince, again, made a quick recovery. Everybody's good. Um, and I'm new to the community, and a, and a community leader, a woman that was a very generous person with ministry, but was a pretty influential person in the community, called me up and said, Chili, uh, there's been this car accident. We're going to do a prayer vigil. We're going to do a prayer vigil so the community can kind of rally around this, you know, this guy, Vince, as he recovers. And so I go, okay, when is it? And she tells me, and she says, it's not a necessity that you're there on Saturday night. You can come the next day. We're gonna do something else the next day. So if you can make it, great. It's not a necessity that you make it that night. I go, well, what's, what time is it? And okay, I'll see if I can do it. I'm going on a date with my wife that night, but if we can make it, we will. She says, it's not a necessity. Come the next day if you have to. Great. I go to dinner and we finish up a little early and I'm looking at my watch and I say to Kimmy, you know, I think we can make this uh, prayer vigil. We should go over there and pray a little bit with some of the folks in the community. So it's at seven o'clock, it's gonna start. We pull in at maybe 6.59, right at seven. And uh, the woman who told me about it is waiting there by the door, pretty anxiously, looks a little upset. And she runs over to the car and she's like, where have you been? And I'm like, you said seven. And she goes, you're running this event. And I go, wait, wait a second. You did not say I was running the event. You said it wasn't even a necessity that I was here. And, and she goes, well, I meant to tell you. And I'm like, well, you didn't. She goes, well, you, we, you have to do it now. So go up there, you're running this event. So I'm walking into this event, a serious event, a prayer vigil. And literally I'm saying, now what's his name again? And they're telling me his name. I walk up on stage, I'm 22 years old. I have no idea what I'm doing. And uh, I get up in front of these folks and I, I welcome everyone. And I think it's a prayer vigil, let's pray. So I go, hey, let's pray now for Vince and pray for full recovery. So I pray and open us and crickets, total silence for a while. You've, you've been there where it feels awkward, right? So I'm like, I'll jump in again and try to get this rolling. So I pray some more, silence, crickets. And I'm literally saying things like, you know, at, at this point, folks, anyone's welcome to jump in, jump in and pray, share your thoughts, nothing. So I'm like, boy, that's been about five minutes. This doesn't feel long enough. So I go, let's just share some thoughts about Vince. Go ahead and share some thoughts. Crickets. I mean, this is a, a mute crowd. I'm like, okay, anything, any thoughts at all? No, nothing. I don't even know who Vince is, so I can't share. So I'm like, all right, it's been about six or seven minutes. This doesn't feel great. So I don't know what's happening, folks. I, this happens to me a lot. I, I don't know what was going through my brain. Maybe nothing. This is what came out of my mouth, though. I go, you know what we should do right now? I'm trying to think. I'm scrambling. What can I do to make this feel a little longer and, and a more appropriate? And I go, let's, let's sing a song together, okay? Never mind the fact that I really can't carry a tune, that there is no band, that no one has any music, no sheet music at all. No one has any lyrics. So it was a terrible, terrible idea, but it comes out of my mouth. Let's sing a song together. So I'm scrambling. Everybody's looking at me like, what are you talking about? And so I'm scrambling. So I'm like, well... What's the song everyone knows? You know, everybody knows Amazing Grace. You know, the old Amazing Grace. I'm like, everybody knows that song. Let's sing that together. So uh, again, I'm so flustered and so nervous that I don't sing the classic Amazing Grace that everyone knows. At the time, a little while back, they had a more contemporary version they had released that went like this. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. Maybe you've heard it. It was like a, a sped up version of it. So solo guy with very little musical ability is standing up in front of a crowd and I start into the amazing grace house. But no one knows it. So everyone's staring at me. I'm bright red. I am singing a solo. Okay. 
It's terrible. I mean, the family's like, this is the guy you got to run this. So I'm singing this song. And if you know this song, there's a female accompaniment that comes in. So it's like, amazing grace, how sweet. And then you get to a point where you're like, alleluia. And the men pause and the women come in with, alleluia, alleluia. And then the men come back with, alleluia. So again, folks, remember, no one knows the song. No one's singing. I'm singing a solo. So I would say in front of everyone with a red face, completely embarrassed, I go, hallelujah. Silence, crickets, while I sit and count in my head. Hallelujah. <laughs> I think people thought I was insane. This was my introduction to this community. Thankfully, Vince recovered. So the Lord had mercy on all of us that day. But uh, that story, silly story, is a example of when something is downplayed, when it's actually a necessity. When it was a necessity for me to know that I was leaving that, for me to plan that out, for me to have action steps for us to take. Total necessity, but it was downplayed. It was told that it was not. And that's a silly example. But what about things in our life that are truly necessities that we have not taken inventory on, that we don't realize that they're there, that they are really foundational? that they are the uh, stalwarts, the things that we really need to rely upon and look at. Ignoring or turning a blind eye to foundational necessities of our spiritual lives will have dire consequences. Okay, we're gonna come back to this. Push pause on that for a second. So back to Psalm 19, 10 and 11. It's a short one, so let me refresh your memory. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned, and keeping them, there is great reward. So here's David referencing scripture and talking about how wonderful it is, what a gift it is. He's talking about the precepts and the laws and all these other things that are coming out of this. And if you take a 30,000 foot view of this, of the entirety of Psalm 19 that we've been studying over the last several weeks, David is referring to, if you had to boil it down, David is referring to the self-revelation of God through his word. The self-revelation of the God of the universe, infinite, all-powerful God, the self-revelation of this God through his word. As we have zoomed into this passage over the last couple of weeks, what is David referring to in regards to this self-revelation of God through his divine word? What is it that he's really trying to hone in on? Is David referring to some generic and general scripture? And that's a lot of the ways that, that even believers view scripture of, oh, I have a general sense of it. I think I got it, right? I don't really need to dive into it consistently because I think I kind of have the gist of it, right? Is that what it is? No, he is specifically describing that portion of the message God has revealed through his prophets up until that time. And this would include the, the Pentateuch, Joshua, Judges, Job, part of Psalm. This is what David is specifically referring to. So in a nutshell, David's referring to the Bible. He's talking about the Bible. Because David is navigating the Old Testament, sometimes this can trip us up to think that, oh, he's just talking about the law, right? He's only referring to the law, the Ten Commandments, etc. But the terms law, testimony, uh, te testimony, precepts, commandment, all of the verses just prior to 10 and 11, they refer collectively to what God has revealed in his word, not just the moral law, but catch this, don't miss this one, not just the moral law, but in particular, he's referring to the great promises of love and mercy and faithfulness. You see, the law was set up to reveal to us that we will fall short, that we can't do it, that we will fail. The law was set up to reveal to us, put a big mirror in front of us and say, look at our sin. Look at how messed up we are apart from a loving creator. And so really the references here are to talk about the great promises of love and mercy and faithfulness of our God. And this has been the focus of what Kurt has been sharing and revealing to us the last couple of weeks from Psalm 19. In fact, in verse seven, David refers to God as Yahweh. Yahweh is the same way that God is referred to when Moses encounters the burning bush. Yahweh. It's God revealing himself to humanity in a personal way and exposing his will and his covenants. Yahweh is covenant keeping. 
Yahweh reveals himself to humanity in a personal way and shares his purpose with humankind. Hear that one more time. Yahweh is a covenant-keeping personal God that shares his purposes with you and I, his created. That should be mind-blowing. But the God of the universe loves us enough to not only care for us and eventually die on the cross to, to free us of our sins through the person of Jesus Christ, but to share his purposes and his hopes and his will with us. And the outlet that he does that with is Scripture. So we focus back on Psalm 19, 10, and 11. Let's borrow a couple questions from the author Wayne Grudem to help frame our time and help us grasp what we mean when we're talking about the necessity of the Bible. So here's a couple of questions from Wayne Grudem. Number one is, for what purposes is the Bible necessary? The first question we would ask ourselves is, okay, if we're going to talk about necessity in Scripture, what purposes is the Bible necessary? And two, how much can people know about God without the Bible? How much can you and I know and how much is revealed to us apart from the Bible? If it's just sort of a vague sense of it or we get it and, hey, check the box, we're good from here on out. We don't really need to study the Word now. We've got it. How much can we know about God without the Bible? Maybe some general revelation or some vague idea about God is enough. Maybe that'll suffice. Would we really use the word necessary when referring to the specific words of God revealed to us in the Bible? Is that the word we would use? Maybe if we just know a little bit, it'll be okay. Or a general idea. Years ago, um, my dad was in ministry for a long time, and then he had a second career where he went back to law school and became an attorney. And one of, he represented this guy named Dave who owned a series of, and operated a series of uh, car lots. And uh, one of them was Dodge Jeep. And uh, at the time, uh, Dodge Durango was kind of their larger SUV, and it maybe it would have been a thirty, forty thousand dollar car at the time. Now it would be a fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollar car, fully loaded. So this is a you know pretty nice vehicle. Um, and a guy comes in and he buys a brand new, right off the lot, brand new Dodge Durango. And Dave, my my dad's client, told the story to me where he said this guy was really rude, really arrogant, really abrasive. Every time Dave would chime in with trying to tell him about the vehicle, he'd be like, "I got it, I got it, yeah, yeah, I know." kind of condescending. And then he'd start to talk to him about basic maintenance on the vehicle. He's like, I've got it. I've got it. Just give me the keys. So the guy was pretty rude, and Dave said he drives off. And about two years later, the guy returns, this time with a tow truck with the Durango in tow. It has 80, it has, excuse me, it has 38,000 miles on it and a blown engine. And Dave thinks, that's odd. A brand new vehicle with a V8 and 38,000 miles has a blown engine. The guy had never changed the oil and was unaware that you had to do that. And Dave said, normally I would just take care of it and maybe I'd do the guy a favor and I'd replace the engine. The guy was such a jerk. He's like, I just made him. Hey, you gotta replace the engine. The guy had no idea. He didn't wanna hear it. He thought, oh, I know. I know what I'm doing. I know how this works. He didn't wanna study. He didn't wanna figure out what the creator of the vehicle knew to be true about it. And it had dire consequences. Grudem would start the process of answering his own questions that he poses here with this definition of the necessity of Scripture. Check this out. This is from Wayne Grudem. Thus, even Old Testament believers had saving faith in Christ. Even Old Testament believers, people prior to Jesus coming and dying on the cross, they had saving faith in Jesus to whom they looked forward. Not with the exact knowledge of the historical details of Christ's life, but with great faith in the absolute reliability of God's word of promise. So let's break this down for a second. What Grudem is talking about here is, having, uh, is about believers having great faith in the absolute reliability of God's word of promise. That's how he ends that quote there. It's always been and, has, and will always be about saving faith found only in Jesus Christ. It is right now and will always be about saving faith found in Jesus Christ and him alone. People before Christ looked to the coming and promised Messiah, and that's how they had faith. I know that the Messiah will come someday. And that's how they had faith, and that's how they were saved. Then during Jesus' 33 years on the earth, people would look, hey, there he is. There's the Messiah. I'm gonna put my faith and confidence in him. 
And that saving faith will be with us trusting and putting our hand in his hand and saying, I trust that this is who he is. John 10, uh, excuse me, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, whoever believes in his heart that Jesus is Lord and confesses with his mouth uh, that, that uh, oh man, I just totally, re- I, I, this is what happens when you throw references out and didn't pre- plan ahead of time. Let me try it again. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That is referencing how it's always been saving faith. Whether you were pre, uh, prior to Jesus, you would look to him. Whether you were there during his 33 years, you would look right to him. Or now, all of us post-resurrection, we look back at Jesus and say, yes, we trust he is who he says he is. He raised from the dead. He died on the cross for our sins. I can have saving faith in him and I can be confident in him. Well, how does he communicate to us? It's through his word. How do we know him better? It's through his living and active word. The necessity of that as we learn and grow. Even as you look at the Old Testament where Psalm 19 resides, God's promises become more and more specific. And this galvanizes and strengthens the faith of believers. But this is still increasingly locked onto the bedrock of Scripture. That's the foundation that we stand on. The promise is specifically revealed to us by God in the Bible. Okay, with all this in mind, let's slow down for a second. With all this in mind, let's look at a couple of additional questions posed by Wayne Grudem. And I ask you, ask these questions to yourself right now. Process and and sort of uh, marinate in these. Do you nourish your soul on the spiritual food of the word as carefully and diligently as you nourish your body on physical food? Second question here would be, what makes us so spiritually insensitive that we feel physical hunger much more acutely than spiritual hunger. What is the remedy? And I'm not talking at you, I'm talking with you. This is me. So many times I treat diving into the word and spending time in scripture and knowing the word well, I treat it as if it's the last thing. If I get to it, I get to it. But it's bottom rung of the priority list. Daily time in the Bible is not just an extra thing We get to if we have time. It is as necessary to us as oxygen or food or water. The daily nourishment spiritually for all of us from the word of God is more vital than the nourishment our body receives from food. Yet most of the time, it's not prioritized like that. If you're like me, it's not. If we're honest. When I, one time a while back, I had a chance to speak to some parents about parenting and and raising our children um, to know the Lord in a real way. And the first question I posed is I kind of walked through, think about with me for a second, your financial plan for your family. And we just threw everything up on a, a dry erase board, you know, 401k and then the retirement plan and what year you're gonna retire, literally what month you're gonna retire, where you need to be financially, you know, the market, how it adjusts, like, you know, when you're gonna pay your house off. We talked through everything and everybody has this extensive plan I mean, down to the, the finest detail. And then we talked about with your children, you know, what about sports, their sports schedules? And they had that all down. What about, you know, their plan for education? And as we walked through these things, we, we ended with, what's your spiritual goals for your kid? What's your plan? And I mean, this is, again, not me talking at you, it's talking with you. It was hard. We were like, I don't, yeah, I just hope they get plugged into church, I guess. And maybe, they're, maybe there's a young life leader that can spend time with them and Yeah, hope it works out. And if it's the bedrock, if it's the most important and vital thing, why does it get that bottom rung priority? It's it's interesting and it challenges us, right? It it, it brings into the light maybe that sometimes our priorities can be off. The necessity of scripture certainly takes it much further than some vague, generalized, and limited understanding of God's word and will. It's necessary to consume the word daily. And I love this word, don't miss it to marinate in it. As I've gotten older, and maybe I'm trying to slow down a little bit, but as I'll spend time in the Word, it used to be sometimes I would just read, hey, check that off. I got my chapter in. I'm ready to go start my day. Now more and more the Lord is revealing to me to to spend time in the Word, maybe read, maybe less, but read a smaller passage several times and then just stop and pray and reflect on it. Lord, reveal your truths to me. The word is living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. This is not just dead old words on a page. These are living and active words of you, Jesus. 
as we marinate in that, how does it change from just empty head knowledge to go from the head to the heart? And we can't just have this empty head knowledge. There's a great illustration I've heard a while back that I think is really good. Imagine a, a nutritionist, an expert in the field of nutrition, and he knows everything there is to know, all the nutrients that are in the foods, everything there is to know. And he's, stand, he's sitting excuse me, in front of a large banquet table with just every food you can imagine stretched out over this table, but he's starving to death. He's starving because he's never taken the step to actually reach out and grab the food and consume it and allow it to nourish his body. He might know everything there is to know intellectually about everything on the table, but until he takes it and eats it, it does nothing for him. As simplistic as that illustration is, it's true for us with the word. To just sort of have a vague understanding about it, but to never take it and consume it and to use that as your daily nourishment will have dire consequences. The Bible is necessary for us maintaining and progressing in spiritual growth because for one thing, it is filled with clear and definite statements about God's will. The the most important thing we could know about. God is all-knowing, he is omniscient. If he's all-loving, all-powerful, and all-knowing, we can trust him long-term and he has the answers and instructions for us to live out these promises. As John 10.10 puts it, Life to the fullest, life abundantly is offered to you and and to me. This confident faith we can have that God reveals to us in the word is saving faith. It will save you and it will save me. This revelatory knowledge in scripture that God graciously gives sinful and messed up people like you and me, he gives us humans the highest degree of certainty we can have. In a world where there's hardly ever certainty in a world where everything feels up and down and insecure and, and, and crazy and haphazard, that this is the one thing that we can have true security in, this foundational truths of God. God's grace in Psalm 1911 also extends to warning us. It seems weird that there's a warning in this in verse 11 about failing to know God's word and, and how that's revealed in the Bible. This is like a warning sign, like a, like a bridge out sign. If you're driving, it's not gonna stop you from going around it and continuing to barrel ahead at 100 miles an hour, but it's these warning signs that are there. And God sets those up because he loves us enough to tell us the truth. He loves us enough to, to get in the way and say, hey, listen, this is not good. Keep going if you want, but trust me in this. You want life to the fullest? You want life abundantly? Here's where it's found. When Kaylee, my oldest, was really little, maybe I've told you this story before, but Kaylee would, you know, as toddlers do, she would always try to get into everything, and she would always try to get underneath our kitchen cabinets. And in there was liquid plumber and Drano. So eventually I had to put child safety locks because she would go in there and grab the liquid plumber, and she'd be trying to get the cap off, and she'd take it over to me with her sippy cup and be like, "Uh, yeah, this looks good. And as the parent, I wasn't a great parent, but at least I knew this, I'd be like, listen, You don't want liquid plumber. You don't want Drano. And I would try to take it from her and she would get so upset. She'd burst into tears. She'd be like, don't tell me what I want. I know I want this. I'm like, trust me, you don't want this. Let's stick with the apple juice. This is no good. But she'd be so upset, she'd think she'd know. Well, I knew better, right? Well, here's a prime moment where the Lord loves us enough to warn us because he knows better. He knows what'll shipwreck our life and our world. So back to this question, do you nourish your soul on the spiritual food of the word as carefully and diligently as you nourish your body on physical food? I remember coming off in, high, in college, uh, I used to live in a, a house of 14 guys, this d- dirty, disgusting house on Ohio State's campus, and half the guys in the house had grown up uh, with a little more means, and so they would go on these nice uh, spring break trips. And the rest of us that were kind of working our way through college would have to, to go on the worst trips ever, right? It'd be like, you know, we'd drive down to the lake or something. So one year we're like, we're gonna hike the Appalachian Trail. So we go down there with very little plan, like a bunch of college buffoons, and we start hiking and we, are, we, get, we go pretty far, a couple days. And we realize we're out of food, this is not good. So no, no one was in any real danger, but we were starving to death for us, right? And we finally get back, to the van, and I mean, we just are, we're dying, right? And we drive, and we're so dirty and gross, and we drive into this little town that we find there's a Bob Evans there. And imagine just, you know, six or seven dirty, smelly, disgusting guys 
running into a Bob Evans and sitting down and we were ordering like we were kings. We're like, you know, more of everything. And they're bringing all these plates out. They don't even fit it. And we are just eating with our hands and we were so excited to consume all this. Silly little illustration, but why do we not view scripture this way? Why don't we wake up in the morning just with this, this, this passion and excitement? I can't wait to consume this. I can't wait to understand and unearth the, the promises that the Lord has for me today. Instead, we, if we get to it, we get to it. Spending time in scripture is actually experiencing God through his divine and inspired word your loving creator. It should be exhilarating and refreshing. Kim and I just came off watching the show Alone. Some of you guys are passionate fans. I'd never seen it. We watched the latest season on Netflix. And if you don't know it, it's like a survival show. And it really is pretty simple where they just drop people in the backwoods in British Columbia in some pretty harsh conditions. And the last person to tap out wins half a million dollars. And this guy who won this season named Troy we watched this little extra part after the end of the season. And in it, he talks about the feeling he had from his first shower after 74 days in this harsh conditions. He's like, the shower had felt like nothing I'd ever, literally it was like exhilarating. That's what spending time in the word should feel like as well to us. All the grime and the grossness of the world all over us that we get to dive into the word and say, Lord, Wash this from me, refresh me, remind me of where real truth lies instead of just sitting in it. The refreshing uh, shower that this guy had pales in comparison to what we can have spending time in the word as God meets us in that. God utilizes the Bible in our lives as a gateway and lens for us to all see him, the world, our neighbors and ourselves in the right way the correct way. Think of how confusing it can get and how many lies we buy into if we bypass the word and we trust and rely on our own instincts. We cannot truly know God in his fullness or the pathway to salvation apart from scripture. David says God's word is more precious and pleasurable than honey and fine gold because he has personally experienced its life-changing benefits. The secret to, to whatever greatness and fulfillment his life possessed was not due to his own cleverness or intelligence or charisma or whatever, power, influence. It was all a gift of the true God who disclosed himself personally through his written word. The Bible is a profound gift to all of us and without it, we will be unable to experience the fullness of the love of God. God's word is profoundly refreshing because it is personal and is graciously given to us so that we can fully experience firsthand his love. This gift has been offered to you and it's been offered to me. The necessity of scripture, let's lovingly challenge ourselves. What would it look like for us to get up and consistently spend time with our creator to marinate in this word? I'll pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this time. Thanks for folks making it out today. Lord, I pray that... Uh, we leave here in knowing you better than when we walked in. Father, I thank you for the gift of scripture, for the gift of this playbook that you've given us for life. And I pray, Lord, that we are challenged to dive in and know you more intimately. In your name I pray, amen. Thanks for coming out. Appreciate you all.